everyone. I'm Rafe Lawson, uh, the Executive Director of the Profitability Analytics Center of Excellence. Uh, as many of you know, PACE's mission is to help organizations make better, more informed decisions through the use of data analytics, employing causal models that include an organization's revenues, uh, costs, and investments. So given that, I'm very happy to host today's webinar on um, better revenue management with AI-enabled analytics. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this area, uh, we have, uh, PACE has interest groups in both of these areas in revenue management and data analytics. I'll talk more about that a little at the end of this webinar, but I encourage you to go to our website, become members and join these interest groups. So today's moderator uh, for the webinar is Professor Julie Harrison. Uh, it's a definitely a pleasure uh, to have her here, especially with her being in New Zealand and having to get up so early. Uh, Julie's an associate professor in the Graduate School of Management at the University of Auckland Business School. She's done extensive research in the area of revenue management and is a co-author of IMA's monograph on revenue management fundamentals. Julie is also lead of PACE's revenue management interest group. So she's definitely very well qualified to moderate today's session. And with that, Julie, please take it away. Thank you very much, Rafe, and welcome everyone, and welcome in particular to our two speakers. It's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce them both to you. Uh, we have Robert Zwerling, who is the um, Managing Director and Founder of Aurora Predictions. Um, he is a high-tech entrepreneur, and he's um, been involved with founding software companies across a variety of um, industries, notably telecom and manufacturing, distribution, data availability, analytics, and AI. Uh, he is uh, an author of numerous papers and books on analytics and AI, and he has presented on this topic uh, across the world. Uh, he's the co-author most recently of two books that I think will be particularly interesting um, to this audience, um, AI Enabled Analytics for Business and Implementing an Analytics Culture for Data-Driven Decisions. Um, Robert holds a uh, a uh, bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering, and he's a registered professional engineer. Our other uh, speaker is Larry Maisel, who is the president and a founder of Decision View Analytics. He's also a former managing senior partner at KPMG Consulting, and he's been a senior executive at PeopleSoft Oracle and in the Balance Scorecard uh, Collaborative. He's also the author of numerous books uh, and articles on activity-based costing and management, on the balance scorecard, and most recently on advanced analytics. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and he's a senior business advisor at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton's uh, Small Business Development Center. Uh, as well as being the president of Decision View Analytics, Larry is also on the board of advisors of Aurora Predictions. He holds a BA in economics, an MBA in corporate finance, and he is a CPA, CGMA. Before we start, I just want to emphasize or, or bring to your attention three recent publications by uh, these two authors uh, that are particularly relevant for our session today. Uh, they relate to analytics and to AI-enabled analytics and business analytics, all of which I'm sure will be of interest to you. Uh, so um, we'll just leave the screen up for a moment. And in terms of the two organizations that they uh, represent, Aurora Predictions is a specialized software company, um, and it's um, developed a number of products, this lights ed um, AI-enabled analytics platform, uh, which helps support um, bus business analytics um, applications within businesses. Uh, and so um, the real advantage with this product is you don't need to be a data scientist, you don't need strong statistic skills and no AIT support. 
So it's a kind of plug and go. Um, and for Decision View, uh, it's a specialized management consultancy company. It works with Aurora Predictions uh, as well as um, and other applications. And it's focused very much on improving performance through using um, analytics tools um, uh, developed through their experienced practitioners and aimed at delivering uh, measurable value. So uh, with that, I would like to pass over now to Larry and Robert uh, for our presentation today. And um, I'm looking forward very much to hearing about this. So thank you. And thank you, Julie, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I've, um, I don't know, I, I've been introduced uh, several and numerous times over the years but it never with a New Zealand accent. So I really found that to be most engaging and, and appreciate uh, uh, it. I, don't, I, I would gather it's about 12, 13 hour time difference between um, uh, us here on the East Coast in the States and uh, where you, 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 you are in New Zealand. So thank you for being with us uh, today. And thank you, Ray for, uh, and Monty for allowing us to um, be with everyone. What we're gonna go through today, what we're gonna talk about um, is how you use AI, artificial intelligence and analytics to combat bias in decision-making. About 20 years ago, um, um, uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky won the Nobel Prize in looking at how psychology influences economic behavior. And what they determined is that we do not act as rational decision makers. And so we believe that AI and analytics becomes additive to your decision making, but doesn't replace human judgment and knowledge of the future. This is a very important point. You, you're gonna, you know, there's autonomous vehicles, there's robotic processing of accounts payable. We're talking about key decision making for management, for executive management to make decisions that impact the operations of their business and the strategies of their business. One of the things that um, about 10 years ago, Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in the, in the book, he put, put forth the notion that we, our brains, our human brains, that we in effect rely on shortcuts, which become biases in our decision-making. He, he, he goes on to say people are not rational when they decide about risk and uncertainty. And so he, 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 he described the, the brain, the process, the think thought process as the brain being one of two systems. System one, which is fast thinking. It's reflective, it's intuitive, it's gut feel. If I say to you as an audience, how much is two plus two? I hope you said four, without even thinking, without even blinking an eye. Because it's so accepted to you over time. Whereas system two, is slow thinking, it's deliberate, it's analytical, it's critical thinking, it's reserved for more complex situations. One of the things that they found is that the human thought process, the brain, when it's in system two, really gets tired again and can be lazy. So if I said to you, how much is 17 times 24? I'm sure all of us could calculate that. But after we have done it, you probably would feel a little bit more tired than you were before you started that. And that's what they see as system two thinking. 
So system one produces various forms of bias because it's taking shortcuts to make decisions about risk and uncertainty. And remember our premise is that AI enabled analytics counterbalances those biases. There are two kinds of biases, generally speaking, individual and group. Let's talk about individual first. Basically, we are affected by our biases. Daniel Kahneman used the expression heuristics. That's behavioral economics. It's how the brain takes shortcuts to process information faster and uses past experience and emotion. What I thought for today, what I do is just share a couple of key types of biases that I think affect each of us every day. And then the, the, the thinking of Kahneman and this whole area is that we operate daily with our biases, but we can be on guard and know when they're a present, especially when we need to make decisions about risk and uncertainty. Well, one bias is inherent bias. And an inherent bias uh, in the, says that I have this perception of what reality is, and I construct a narrative to support that. And that no amount of, 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 of data is going to make what I believe untrue. So you, you're making a decision based on what you think that narrative is telling you. We have found, and you'll find over and over again, that when you use AI-enabled analytics, when you use statistics, mathematics, that you get a different, you get a potentially a different insight. And th therefore that's why we say it's additive to judgment. Hindsight is another bias. Haven't we thought about how we know after the fact, we are clearer about what we would have predicted. How many times it's that, I told you so. You go in with a budget request to your management and it may be approved, maybe not. Let's say it's approved, but really underneath you, the, the manager saying, I don't think you're going to be able to close all those deals that you think you can make. And then it turns out that you didn't. And hindsight bias says, well, I told you so. The, uh, another bias is confirmational bias. One of the things about confirmational bias is no matter how much data I can present to you, it's not going to dissuade you to what you believe is, is correct, is in, interpreting your environment, your events. And so your decision making is not based on relevant information, but based on what you believe to be um, in, in, in going, uh, what you believe in the past. And the last bias, and the one that I, I'd like to ask you a quick pop quiz. It goes this way. I'm gonna describe an individual. And I want you to tell me what you, at the end, I'll ask the question. So this individual is very shy and withdrawn. Invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul. He has a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Is this individual more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Now, if I ask this in a, one of my MBA classes, it'd be interesting to see how many hands would go up that the, the, um, uh, for each. Invariably, when this question is asked to groups, invariably the answer is librarian. But did you know that in the United States, there are 20 male farmers for every male librarian? 
And so statistics will tell you probability, it is more likely that this individual is sitting on a tractor somewhere rather than sitting behind a desk in a library. Because we use statistics 20 to one, it's more likely of that that is the right outcome. I quickly want to talk about group um, bias in decision making. One is called the Abilene Paradox. The way it's characterized is don't rock the boat. And in the Abilene Paradox is where individuals will go along with a decision, even though internally they may not agree with that decision. The other group bias is groupthink, where it's characterized as go along to get along. So in making decisions, the group will reach consensus, even if it might not be the op optimized decision, it is to, that the group is in, co co um, the group is in um, consensus and feels that they can move forward with the decision. The issue here with group bias is that it's not, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily valid, not necessarily correct or optimal in terms of decision making. And therefore, in, a, in that kind of decision setting, again, AI-enabled analytics is a tool and a platform that is invaluable. We're gonna cover five use cases that demonstrate how analytics is relevant to revenue management. One is analytics scorecard, another is in demand forecasting, the sales pipeline, predictive trends, and, and maximize billing in a supply constraint world, which we are experiencing today. First, the balance scorecard. I think most many of you are familiar with the balance scorecard. Well, the balance scorecard had four basic objectives, as, as you can see on, on the screen. You wanna manage your strategy, you wanna communicate your strategy, you want to align your resources and you want to encourage cohesive behaviors and decision making. The circles tend to be the strategic objectives or what we used to call do wells. The lines indicate where one do well it has a cause and effect impact on another do well. And that's what the red arrows signify. This is terrific, except for one thing. All these relationships are anecdotal. We used to sit in workshops or you would do interviews, but it was not based on analytics, data analytics, where you would apply solid science-based mathematics to the data. So what my, myself, Robert, and our third author, Jesper Sorensen, what we came up with in writing, in the, in writing the book is, you know, that there's, there's a way to now bring that together where you have that kind of a scorecard or a KPI reporting system and add analytics to come up with the analytics scorecard. So we did that for a hypothetical company called call, Phone Calls or, or Us. <clears throat> And because we're talking about revenue, the growth of revenue can be achieved. The one of the KPIs to grow top line revenue is to improve your customer churn. So what we did is we identified those measures that impact customer churn. And what we were able to do a show <clears throat> is how analytics can validate those relationships. One of the things that came out of that, that, that could come out of that process is to find a cause and effect that is not correlated. So you can, you're not demonstrating a true, if this, then that effect. 
think about revenue quality. Why am I giving away revenue as a discount if it's not going to improve and reduce my, and, uh, my customer churn? And so that was demonstrated in, in using correlation analysis. The other is looking at customer satisfaction and correlating that with churn. And what we found is it is correlated. Well, that's pretty intuitive. I don't think that's one, something we would not have felt previously, but what we were able to measure is the strength and the direction of that relationship and then be able to monetize it so that if you have a 70% satisfaction rating and you improve that to 75%, when we look at the analytics, it's not going to have an impact. Whereas if you move your satisfaction from 70 to 80 or greater, that's where you have that, that if you will, that inflection point and you will have a, a direct impact and improve your revenue. Proving revenue in this case is increasing revenue through the inverse, which is the reduction of churn. Again, we can cover each of these areas, but the, the ability to bring together on an analytic scorecard, this kind of insight we believe is particularly valuable. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Robert Swirling, and he will pick up uh, uh, the additional use cases. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good morning, all. Well, it's morning for me anyway. Uh, good morning, all, and truly you too. Um, now let's go into some detailed analysis on how we're going to apply AI and analytics to both revenue and because we can to expenses as well. And the first thing to understand is, um, if you can advance the slide, is that um, there's, um, in our calculations we've written about in our book, AI Enabled Analytics for Business, there's about $242 billion lost annually in um, uh, underperformance due to under-optimized planning and to errors. And this is despite the fact that $500 billion is spent every year on state-of-the-art enterprise software covering every aspect of business. So if you look at, for example, demand planning, and if you just bring that up, on average, there's a 35% error in demand planning. Well, that cascades. If you don't have your demand plan right, if you have a high forecast error, like 35% from state-of-the-art enterprise systems, you need more buffer stock. And then um, you also need more finished inventory. And then that translates into more excess and obsolete inventory. And then that, in spite of all that excess, you still have 2.5%, or at least retailers have 2.5%. Every year on systems transaction performance is quite simple. Robert? Yes. Uh, I'm 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 not hearing you. I think you're you're back now. No, I'm here. Uh, now I hear you fine. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, and um, we can use analytics across a, a wide spectrum of things to make better decisions. Let's use it uh, in a very powerful way uh, in, in, uh, in forecasting and demand forecasting where we have this big error. So what you're seeing is these maroon bars. We're, we're working with a $750 million CPG manufacturer. 
and for a particular store here, the Walmart store, the maroon ball, the Nine percent accuracy of forecasting the demand. Demand twelve months a year advance. Uh, for, um, if uh, my audio is dropping here and there, my apology. Um, the internet here is um, is on, and uh, I hope uh, I hope I don't lose you all. Uh, the, point to, the point to see here is that now if we overlay the demand forecast made in a year advance from a demand planning tool that has no AI, we can see that the forecast accuracy is significantly less than the AI forecast accuracy and significantly under the blue line which is the target that the company set for what it wanted its forecast accuracy to be. So they wanted an 80% accuracy for the year and demand planning systems uh, could not approach that. AI could approach that. Overall, the year over year accuracy was about 65% or a 35% error. So this is how we first step and how we make better decisions, is having better forecast accuracy that's developed from analytics. Because today what happens when you don't have AI-enabled analytics, um, you, can, um, you can make the wrong decisions because demand planners will just say, well, I know what the demand plan system said, but I'm just gonna change it to what I think it should be. So AI gives us a much better way to forecast. Let's go to the next slide. The next opportunity here is in using AI for sales propensity analytics. So here we're talking about a $1 billion um, uh, hardware manufacturer, high-tech hardware manufacturer. And um, here, this is a universal problem amongst um, <laughs> all sales organizations. And all salesmen think that all of their deals are going to Robert, you've, you've dropped your audio. Um, You're back. All right. Uh, again, my apologies. There's not a lot I can I can do right here without having to switch over to another system, and that'll, that may take too much time. Um, uh, let me see if we can continue on this. Larry, if you can. Um, advance the uh, words. So we have a $1 billion high-tech manufacturer and they say, we know 50% of our forecasted deals aren't gonna close in the quarter. We just don't know which 50%. Well, if we apply um, analytics and artificial intelligence, we can actually bucketize each of the deals into those that have a high propensity to close, a mid propensity to close and a low propensity to close. And the beauty of this is we now can make better decisions on our revenue on where to focus our sales force, because we shouldn't focus them on everything. We should focus them on the things that have the best propensity of closing. Because oftentimes what happens if you don't know the deals that have the best propensity to close and you chase all the deals, the way you get a deal to close is by offering large concessions and large discounts, which impacts revenue quality and profit quality. So through better analytics, we make better decisions 
on how to better manage our sales force to produce better quality revenue. We can continue. The next wonderful example is using AI predictive signals. Now this is on a $400 million manufacturer. And this is the typical report like product manufacturer, uh, product managers would get, which shows them year over year how each of their products are selling. And this is in units sold, millions of units sold. And the wonderful thing about product managers is when they see a downward trend like this negative 22%, they know how to fix it. They'll make discounts, they'll make product placements, they'll do other things, but they know how to fix it. And on all these areas where you see negative trends, the product managers did a good job. If you can continue, Larry. And they were able to affect revenue by adding $10 million. Excellent job. But because they didn't have AI to predict the future of the trend, they couldn't see the good trends, like in these different product categories that had good trends, but were predicted to go bad. And guess what? They did go bad. And that cost the business $18 million in revenue. So net net, rather than being up by $10 million, they were down by $8 million. The other thing they couldn't see is the good trend that could go better. And that's in the yellow, bo uh, the yellow box. When we have a good trend that's predicted to get better, we have pricing power. So in all these areas, we're able to see unseen risks and unknown opportunities, all through which we'll make better decisions because we'll be fleshing out our biases because we think if something has a good trend and we, we see the way it is, our decision is leave well enough alone. Uh, nothing's broken, we don't need to fix it. Rather than we better close the barn door before the horse leaves. So Larry, if we can advance. Uh, the final example I'm gonna show you today is very, very timely in this area of um, constrained supply chain. And here we're looking at a $4 billion high-tech manufacturer and uh, who can't uh, fulfill all their demand because of constrained supply. So here what we do is we first start to use analytics to define the efficiency of each deal not the efficiency of each product, but the efficiency of each deal in their pipeline. So you can see when we look at the upper quintile, the top quintile, where we have $106,000 of uh, average sale price per deal. And we look at the bottom quintile where we have $10,000 average sale price per deal that's a huge difference. That's a 10X difference. So if we take the top four quintiles, if we produce these 1,494 products, it produces $40 million of revenue, or should say billings, versus the bottom quintile has 1,150 products and only produces $7.9 million of revenue. So here, efficiency matters. Analytics is revealing that it's not just about building, and this is what manufacturing was doing. Manufacturing's mindset was, well, let's build our most uh, profitable and our largest uh, revenue products because that will increase our, our revenue versus what deals do we have and looking at the deals. And the reason the deals were important is because this manufacturer couldn't ship a deal and therefore couldn't bill for the deal until um, it had a, uh, could, could fulfill all the products in the deal. So you, may, you might have a $100,000 uh, product in the deal, but you couldn't ship it because you ran out of uh, stock of a $50 product, and therefore your deal was held back. 
So it's not about just the products that you can build um, and which are more uh, bigger and more profitable than the other. It's about looking at the deal size and looking at how much bang for the buck we can get for each deal. Because when we do this, and Larry, you can move on, we can see here that for only 30% more products, we get $32.5 million more in billings. Very powerful and very effective when you're looking at uh, a constrained supply chain. So if we put this all together and now we bring it back to our analytics scorecard, another company, uh, a $460 million manufacturer, wanted to uh, um, increase um, its sales and reduce its cost through supply chain, demand planning, inventory, and sales. And let's walk through these opportunities. So we can reduce inventory on hand by reducing the demand forecast error. And for every 1% decrease in demand forecast error, we could yield a 1.5% reduction in inventory on hand. On average, across their tier one customers, that amounted to a 34% reduction using AI versus demand planning software, a 34% reduction in forecast error, which means an uh, $88 million reduction in inventory. Another example of using analytics here with a very sophisticated uh, concept called Monte Carlo simulation, we can change something called min-max where, when you, where your inventory levels min and max, we can do them dynamically instead of the static ERP um, set min-max and improve our inventory on hand, reduce it by another $2.6 million. Another example, using those predicted trends uh, that we just saw, is how to apply that to chargebacks. Uh, uh, suffering for, they were suffering from $14.5 million in shortage and fill rate fines. Well, we could cut that in half and improve their, um, their revenue by $7.2 million. And finally, bringing it all together with the AI forecasting, uh, with the AI predictive indicators, using something that we didn't see, which is AI lead indicators to see what's driving uh, the business, uh, and also using correlations to find supply chain disconnects so we can eliminate a lot of stockouts. That amounted to a 5% lift on sales, which is another $23 million. So when you look at that and put this analytic scorecard together through all these different initiatives, we can improve the decision-making in terms of how much we have inventory on uh, do we have on hand? How much finished goods do we have to have on hand? What do we have to have on our shelves in order so we don't suffer from stockouts? How do we improve our sales quality? So we're not giving excessive um, discounts, but we're also not being penalized um, from uh, fill, uh, shortages in the fill rates. So all of this combined can improve decision-making to the tune of $120 million. So the bottom line is analytics improve our decision-making. They give us a better visibility for better planning and they give us visibility to make uh, improvements in our financial performance. Larry, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I hope the, the group really can get a, um, an insight into how AI analytics is additive to decision-making and how you can then monetize and quantify the impact of decisions on the business. What I what wanted to do here is just um, summarize uh, the areas that you can cover in sales. You can do predictive sales closures as, as um, what deals will close as Robert described. Customer churn as, as I, I summarized, 
certainly to do sales forecasting, revenue forecasting um, that will come up from your groups or your marketing groups. I know mm -hmm. that when I had um, responsibility for managing a, a fairly large sales force, I would get every week, I would get the sales forecast. Well, I knew that, as Robert said, I knew this, some deals would, would close, some wouldn't, but it was difficult to know which and which was which. And then I, we would try to um, refine that whole process with analytics and with now with easy to use analytical software, we can really do, do that in, in, in very quickly. Uh, so in terms of finance, certainly in your forecast and budgeting process um, is a, 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 a natural way <clears throat> to apply AI analytics. We've covered operations and we've covered uh, supply chain, which in today's world <clears throat> is critical given the chaos that is going on, not only in supply chain, but the chaos that is going on in our world events, um, unfortunately. So with that, let me summarize. First of all, the, the human brain relies on, on shortcuts. We call the, the, the term that was given to that is heuristics, and that creates biases in decision-making, which we've covered. Analytics mitigates these biases to give you deeper insights, which can be translated into impactful um, recommendations to make better decisions. And that clearly can be used to improve your revenue management. Analytics, as I just covered, can be applied across a broad section of functional areas or operating areas within your business, certainly to manage costs, grow revenue, and really improve the revenue quality. We believe to be successful in developing an analytics culture within an organization. And an analytics culture is where you value AI-enabled decision-making AI-enabled analytics for decision-making. And those executives support, how do, how do you support? You support it with budget. You support it with bandwidth, giving the people the time and, 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 and encouragement to do the analytics and to and not just add, be additive to their daily routines, and the third budget, bandwidth, and the third focus. Keep the organization focused on these that are <clears throat> important. And if that is done, and executives pursue analytics and cultivate an analytics, nurture an analytics culture, they will be rewarded from improved business performance but those <clears throat> who do not risk being Passover. And last, <clears throat> AI-enabled analytics, we believe is most successfully achieved when you do it as a proof of value, which is the quickest path at the lowest cost and risk to implement analytics and provides the template for scaling the internal adoption across <clears throat> your organization. I th um, Julie, we have time for Q and A. Thank you very much, Larry and Robert, for an excellent presentation. So I'm going to open the floor now for our questions. I think we've got about another um, 10 or 15 minutes. If you do have a question, 
uh, perhaps if you could put it into the chat function or um, if you would like to ask your question in person, um, by all means, um, feel free to unmute. Um, perhaps if you put your hand up so I can see who's wanting to ask the question. Um, but to kick off, I have a question. I'd like to pick up on a point, Larry, that you made about the chaos that we've been experiencing, uh, not just this year, but really for the last two years. And I guess that must have must have um, new challenges or present new challenges for predictive analytics. So I'd be interested to hear um, your comment about, you know, what do you do at this, the, the start of 2020 uh, when COVID first hits, for example? Um, with COVID meaning where historical patterns of sales or operational um, activities may not be indicative because of a, uh, on a, uh, a black swan type of event as we experienced with COVID. Is that, Julie, is that yes. uh, uh, the, the thrust? Yes, very um, much so. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll give you a short answer, and then I'm going to ask Robert to build on it. What we do is we look at the, the, the time series of past data. And when you realize that that might not be purely indicative, one can then do some assumptions about what will occur going forward. So if we have a good predictive model, for example, we take 36 months of data, we use the last 12 months, which is actual, but we use that to, to validate the model. So, it's a, so we're, we're doing a back test. Then we know that the predictive calculations, algorithms exist, and then we can then make some assumptions by saying we're gonna increase that by 10%, by 20%. And using, and we didn't show this, the technique what we have is called fair challenge. We can actually pinpoint those customers where we think we will return to a level of business that occurred before COVID and even grow the business afterwards. Or it will shrink, but we can use scenario planning knowing <clears throat> that the predictive value has integrity, has validity. Uh, like likely outcomes. Robert, do you want to build on that? Just, uh, just a little bit, because I think you did a good job. I think the, the way um, we approach it anyway, is that um, the, um, if you think of a black swan event, it, it's, by its definition, it's unpredictable. But it's, it's also similar. So you can have a pandemic, which is unpredictable, but there are other things that have happened. A hurricane, you know, a massive snow so, a, a, a snowstorm or things like that. Now, there may not be a year or two, uh, but they tell you what happens. There are models in the past that tell you what happened or can happen in these kinds of events. So there are things that happen before the event, like the hurricane, during the event, the hurricane, and after the event, the hurricane. And so they may be exaggerated one way or another, but we can use those models to predict going forward how things will uh, uh, reveal themselves. And then we can use, as I was mentioning earlier, this thing called Monte Carlo simulation to give us not just one value, but a range of value. So we actually can see how history will unfold. So while we cannot predict a black swan event, we can use analytics in order to do uh, relatively accurate, in fact, very accurate still, uh, forecasting, revenue forecasting, demand forecasting uh, for uh, our business and be within a planning range of tolerance. Thank you. Um, that's an excellent answer. Um, I keep waiting for normality to return, but I think we're a few years away from that yet. 
So we have a few questions now in the chat. Uh, I think maybe if we start with Chris, uh, Christian's first question. Um, so he's asked um, in the examples uh, that you've provided, um, what part is down to um, improved tools and what is um, and what is the, the part of the, the data? I think Christian, is, is that what you were wanting to ask? Yes. It's basically what is a part of uh, improving the competitive and business intelligence, the data, the input, and what is a part of just having better tools mean managing data. Yeah, uh, Robert, the, the, as I uh, and Joe, as I interpret the question, then Christian is what what impact does AI enable analytics have on your competitiveness, and then separately, how is AI enable analytics? How is that compared to business intelligence, as we think of business intelligence in a in in the more I guess more common usage as a data visualization tool? Um, let me. Um, no, no, sorry, it's not really my question. My question is about the input, what in all those improvements you mentioned, what come from the fact that you improve the data input and what is the part which come from the tools? Let's say, put it another way, you don't change level of data input, you right. just put the tools, what is the improvement? Now you change your data input or you improve your competitive and business intelligence, and then what is the result? Robert, do you want to take a crack at that? Sure. Um, so <laughs> I guess the, the best way to answer it is saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, data and tools. Um, and um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of like a hand in glove. Um, they go together. Uh, you, you, um, you obviously need the data to do um, the analytics. Um, so, and then you need analytics to do the data. There are tools, and if I can classify them, and let me just clap, let me just work with analytic tools versus data visualization. Because data visualization is really looking at the past and allowing us to visualize the past. But if we look at um, analytic tools that have the analytics, the mathematics, the artificial intelligence capabilities, um, that is a level, uh, an order of magnitude over what we can get from our transactional systems, our BI systems, our data visualization systems. So there's where the tool plays a tremendous part in improving our decision-making and giving us unbiased predictions and forecasts. So it is, that part of it is the tool. Now, as we use the tool, we input data. When we input the data, we are going to learn about the data that we need in order to make better decisions. Let me give you an example. And I hope this answers your question. So when we were looking, uh, I, I was doing some work on um, sales analytics, uh, similar to the ones that we saw before. And one of the inputs we brought in um, was uh, gender into, uh, we, we had a number of things, gender, age, salary, tenure, those kinds of things. We brought into the analysis, into the analytics tool, to determine if that had um, uh, a predictive quality to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of salesmen and sales closures. And after we went through it, we found that gender and age had no um, uh, analytical or correlative relation to the efficiency or the effectiveness of a salesman being able to close a deal. So as we were using the analytics, we were learning what was data we didn't need, what data 
we were missing that we do need in order to get better predictive capabilities. So that's why I, I hope I wasn't being uh, facetious. I was really saying it's yes, it's both the tool that delivers the outputs that we need. As we use the tool, we will learn about the data and the data that we need and the data that we don't need and the quality of the data that we need in order to make better analytics and have better analytics out there. Yeah, uh, Robert, that's excellent. Uh, Julie, um, maybe one more quick question, then I know we want to leave some time at the end for, for Rafe to talk yes. about the uh, uh, pace. So is there a quick question a, that we want? We have an excellent question from Do uh, to uh, Toby, which is around, if you're advising a company that's new to AI with analytics, um, what do you, what would you advise as the lowest hanging fruit um, where they can get the fastest payback? And I'm sure you ask that question all the time. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I think there's two, I, I have two answers. My first answer is um, revenue forecast. And I think Robert's answer, and Robert, you, cor you correct me if I'm wrong, is demand forecast, plan the demand forecasting. I think those are two impactful areas that the um, AI-enabled uh, analytics can really make a difference to an organization and quickly impact the organization. Robert? Well, I, two quick answers. First, not to be a, a, a smart ass, but it's anywhere and everywhere that you can apply it. <laughs> but, but to Larry's point, the quickest is the top line and the highest impact is the, uh, uh, that, that, that has visibility is the top line. Revenue forecasting, sales forecasting, demand forecasting are everything that drives the business. So if you, if you bring it to bear there, that's always a good place to start. Uh, thank you. Um, that's always been the message that um, I've tried to emphasize when I teach revenue management is that uh, impact to the top line is always uh, larger than impact to, to costs. So I'm going to pass back now to uh, Rafe and thank you once again to Larry and Robert. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. And I'd like to... Uh reiterate that. Thank you, Larry and Robert. That was a great presentation, very timely. And uh, thank you, Julie, for moderating. You did a great job today. For I would like everyone on the webinar to know that PACE has a lot of resources in this area that you can avail yourself of. I'd like to encourage you to follow PACE on LinkedIn if you haven't already and on Twitter. We also have a variety of interest groups on PACE's website. And two of those are very applicable to the topic today. One is on revenue management uh, that Julie and Christian, who's also on this call, are, are co-lead. Uh, and then we also are starting on April 7th, an interest group on data analytics it's, you know, given the uh, Larry Roberts talk today, you can see it's, uh, there's tremendous uh, areas for improvement, it's an exciting area. And uh, I'm looking very much to launching this, this uh, interest group and uh, would encourage all of you to join it if this is an area of interest to you and, and become engaged in that interest group's work. Uh, we don't have a registration link yet for the launch event. Uh, we will be sending it out uh, within the week, but you know we will be announcing that on on our on LinkedIn. So again, I encourage you to uh, follow us there. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for uh, attending our webinar, and thank you to the presenters and, and to our moderator. A great job by everybody, and please join us next time for our next webinar.